and welcome to our second interactive leader session of 2012. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Pat Gould, Managing Director of Marketing and Communications at the SOA. If you need technical assistance at any time today, click the live support button in the bottom left area of your screen or send an email to soa at compartners.com. You can also download the slides by clicking on the download presentation button next to that live support button at the bottom left. I'd like to introduce the SOA leaders on today's call. We have Brad Smith, President of the SOA. We have Tanya Manning, President-Elect of the SOA, and Greg Heydrich, the SOA's Executive Director. Today, Brad and Tanya will cover highlights from the recently completed um, meeting of the Board of Directors. Greg will share some results from the 2011 Member and Candidate Survey. Tanya's going to talk about some recent examples of actuaries in the news as well as our upcoming Centers of Actuarial Excellence Summits, and then we'll share a few additional updates from the SOA. In the time we have remaining, uh, we'll take um, your questions that you can submit during this webinar. Um, you can ans a a send a question to us at any time by clicking the Ask a Question box area and typing in your question and then hitting Go. The, uh, this webinar will be archived on the SOA website soon. And at the end of the call, we will ask you to take a very short survey about the session that helps us learn what you liked and didn't like and what you'd like to see in future interactive sessions. With that, I'll hand it over to Brad to talk about some of the highlights from the June board meeting. Brad? Thanks, Pat. First, let me welcome all of you to this session. We have members representing 11 countries listening in today. We covered a lot of ground at our June board meeting. It was very productive with several great discussions. Let me share some of the highlights with you. First, let's talk about the strategic plan. The strategic or the, the Society of Actuaries is a business, although many of us do not think of it as such. I know I didn't used to. It has almost forty million of revenue, it has competitors both within the actuarial profession and outside the actuarial profession seeking a piece of that revenue. Over the years I've been involved with both businesses that have had an effective strategic plan and those that have not. Those that do not tend to pinball between disparate tactics with no basis for choosing whether to choose them or not. Having an effective strategic plan allows the board of an organization to judge the merits of a proposed tactic against the objectives of the strategic plan. Does the tactic advance the organization's strategic objectives or not? Does this mean the plan is set in stone? Of course not. Any organization's objectives have to be fluid and be adjusted based upon the environment it finds itself in. The fact that the Society of Actuaries updates its strategic plan every five years or so represents recognition of that need. However, more often than not, it's the tactics that change and not an organization's strategic objectives. We've seen that this year with the introduction of the General Insurance Casualty Track. Offering a General Insurance Casualty Track is consistent with the SOA's strategic objectives. Likewise, the pursuit of consolidation of the U.S.-based actuarial organizations was not a new strategic objective. Rather, it was a tactic consistent with the SOA's strategic objectives of being a global leader in providing actuarial education and research while being an efficient user of members' volunteer time and money. The draft strategic plan will be shared with members and candidates and employers and other stakeholders later this summer. We plan to make it as easy as possible for you to review and comment on, this, on the draft plan. I want to emphasize the importance of membership feedback it will affect uh, what we finally adopt, and, and we look forward to uh, your input. It will shape the final version of the plan. Watch for more information on this soon. Also at the uh, board meeting, uh, uh, we received an update on the uh, Canadian Institute's um, plan to provide exam exemptions for the completion of university work. CIA. Uh, uh, plans to provide, as announced, it will provide exam exemptions to students at some universities for four preliminary examinations. The CIA leadership has asked the SOA to recognize these exam exemptions for university coursework in lieu of passing four preliminary SOA exams. There are many ramifications if the SOA were to decide to do so. The board discussed many of these ramifications at its June board meeting and will continue to do so at its October meeting. A team is working on providing the necessary input for the board to come to a conclusion. Some of the issues include maintaining quality control of the education process. If the exemptions are appropriate for Canada, why not the United States? Why not in non-U.S. based exam centers? Is the Canadian approach scalable for the SOA? 
Does the SOA have the resources, both volunteer and staff, to expand this beyond Canada? If so, what are the budget ramifications in the form of lost revenue and increased expense? The SOA's membership has reacted negatively in the past to the granting of exam credits for university coursework. Does this represent a first step toward FEM? Will membership perceive it as such? Other professions require testing of the material. Accounts must pass the CPA. This is the CPA exam. Attorneys must pass the bar exam. Doctors must pass their boards. What makes the actuarial profession special? These are the questions that the board will have to address. Personally, I intend to keep an open mind, but have severe reservations with respect to whether the society should grant the, the CIA's request. Now I'll turn it over to Tanya to cover a couple of topics from the June board meeting. Tanya? Thank you, Brad. Um, another topic that we talked about at our board meeting was experience studies. We have a special team that's been assigned the task of looking at the current and possible future strategies related to these studies. Now, the SOA has 16 studies that run concurrently, and they cover a pretty broad range of topics. These go from traditional life mortality, insurance mortality, to even long-term care insurance, disability income, pension. We even have um, studies that look at private placement bond default rates and also one st a study that looks at the incident and severity of cancer. So we have a lot of time and effort that are devoted into the experience studies, and I would imagine that every member of the SOA has been affected or uh, has used um, the results of these experience studies. Now, the reason we have a group looking at this is partly good governance, but it's also because we're seeing some changes in this area. First, there's some new trends, such as there's principal-based reserving, and also there's um, the new financial challenges facing many people and um, many governments over increased longevity. We also see that there is a need for some broader and deeper studies. And, of course, we are expanding our membership um, on an international basis, so we're going to need to look at how to meet the needs of our members who are outside of North America with our experience studies. So all of this has resulted in an increased need, we think, for the SOA's <clears throat> experience studies with these um, trends, and we'll have a group that's going to look at seeing how we can best meet these. So we're hoping that the changes and recommendations that come back from this group to the board will ensure that our future studies are going to be more valuable and useful to our members, regulators, and just the general public. We also expect them necessarily to take less time from start to finish because we have gotten feedback that um, we need a little bit of a quicker turnaround from the beginning stage to the final product. Um, the review team should have a recommendation for our board in October on how we might um, re-engineer and improve our experience studies so you can look for more information on that following our um, next board meeting. At our board meeting, we also talked about um, how we can look at our relationships with our candidates, those who are sitting for exams, and how we might improve that relationship. Um, our profession competes for the um, bright, math-focused candidates with other professions, and this is really um, especially true when you look at those who are considering a career in the financial and risk management area. So as a result, we decided that it would be helpful for us in order to connect with these candidates and also to make them, convince them to stay with our um, profession as a career is to connect with them beyond just the education process. And so we're looking at trying to establish a stronger and an earlier relationship with these candidates as a way to promote that lifelong relationship. And also we're thinking, well, if we can draw in and have more of a relationship versus just sending them out exams, um, we can increase their volunteering and support once they do get their designation. So um, with this in mind, we are um, looking at what we can do. Um, first, one of the simple questions we ask is, what do the candidates actually want and what are their needs? Um, one way to connect with someone is certainly to um, provide them something that they need that would help them as they progress in their career and um, as their students, either as, as an employer or at a university. So we're looking at this. We're doing a multi-phase market research study, looking at what our members need and want, and also looking at what other organizations do professional with their professional membership associations and how they support those who are trying to attain a designation through their organization. 
So this group is going to look at and analyze the research, and they're going to come back with a recommendation again on um, specific ideas and ways that we can strengthen our relationship with our candidates. And um, so I look forward to hearing that. I think this is a very important initiative. I know back when I was taking exams, I did not have much more of a perception of the SOA other than they were the ones who sent me the exam and set the syllabus. And I, it was not something that I felt terribly connected with until I had my designation and probably started volunteering. And I think that it would have been a better development for me in my career, my understanding of the organization, and there was a lot more that it could have done to support me if I had a different relationship with the SOA early on. And so hopefully we will figure out how to do that and at the same time draw a lot more members into the profession and um, keep getting the, um, the brightest candidates out there. So with that, I will turn it over to, um, I think, Greg, you're next to talk about our member and candidate survey. Thanks, Tanya. Um, every year we conduct uh, a member and candidate survey, uh, which helps us uh, understand satisfaction levels our members and candidates have with the SOA, uh, with our activities, uh, gives us a lot of guidance on how we can better meet the needs and expectations of members and candidates. Uh, all members are invited to participate, as well as a sample of our candidates. Uh, this, uh, this year, about 3,600 SOA members and about 600 pre-ASA candidates uh, uh, participated in the survey. I wanted to cover a few points uh, uh, that we learned from, the, uh, from that survey. I'm happy to report uh, first that uh, all of our key satisfaction and performance scores remained essentially steady. We had seen all of those uh, numbers rise last year across the board. Uh, we did have uh, some slight leveling off this year back to the levels that we've seen over the last three years. So a very steady four-year trend now uh, in terms of what our members and candidates are telling us. Uh, on the advancing the actual profession question, a key measure that we watch, uh, virtually an identical 6.7 result to what we've seen over the last three years. On our supporting, the profession, supporting your professional needs question, again, uh, virtually identical 6.7. And this is on a scale of 0 to 10 uh, rating, uh, similar to what we've seen over the last three years. Uh, when we ask members and candidates about the areas where they would like to see uh, more support uh, from the SOA, uh, the most common responses we get are for, are for more web-based uh, CPD uh, offerings at a lower cost, of course. Uh, more offerings in uh, those members' uh, areas of professional interest, uh, and more guidance on uh, how to meet uh, CPD requirements. Uh, some additional findings with respect to education and advocating for the profession. Uh, first, our members clearly believe uh, the qualification process creates highly educated actuaries and should remain very rigorous. Uh, that comes through both in the, uh, in the uh, quantitative responses as well as in the volunteered uh, responses that members give us. Our exam candidates are concerned at the frequency of change uh, in, exam, uh, in the exam structure uh, and, of course, at the relevance, uh, about the relevance of the uh, content on our exams. Those are both uh, areas that we care deeply about, and uh, the Education Executive Committee spends a lot of time uh, thinking about, working on, and taking into account in our education planning. Our members also feel that the SOA is, an, is a, a strong advocate for the profession but they want an even greater focus on promoting the profession and skills of actuaries with employers. We've seen these comments about the importance of promoting the profession from members in the U.S., Canada, and Asia. It's con consistent across the board. Uh, this year, uh, I think for the first time, we asked uh, some questions of uh, actuaries who are themselves employers of other actuaries to begin to get their perspective on uh, qualities and attributes that they're looking for and seeing uh, in candidates and newly credentialed actuaries. They see strong skills being developed, uh, and beyond uh, the purely actuarial knowledge that's being imparted, they also see uh, in the, in the uh, newly credentialed actuaries a great curiosity and willingness to learn, a lot of energy and enthusiasm for the profession, and a lot of in innovative ideas and new thinking. Uh, they also look for, uh, they're looking for some additional skills and have given us some feedback on areas they believe uh, uh, our actuaries need to improve on. Uh, the ability to see the big picture, the ability to understand the industry they're working in, the business they're working in, payer systems, and so forth. And as we've seen before in other employer surveys, uh, these actuarial employers, actuaries who are employers of actuaries, see a need to continue to develop soft skills of actuaries, business and technical communication skills, writing skills, communication skills, and general business acumen. 
Finally, uh, we also ask questions uh, of our members who volunteer with the SOA. Um, this, is a, this is a very important measure for us, given the importance to the SOA of, of uh, volunteer support and volunteer activities. In 2011, the SOA was supported by over 2,300 member volunteers. There were many more uh, additional uh, non-member volunteers as well, bringing our total up around 3,000 total volunteers. 30% of our member volunteers participated in this survey, and of those, 85% uh, who have volunteered said they would certainly volunteer again. We're very pleased with that result. We're working hard to make sure that the volunteering experience is valuable both for the actuary who volunteers and for their employers. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you who participated in the Member and Candidate Survey earlier this year. Your responses and comments are extremely valuable to us, and they do guide the work that we do for you and changes we make in the services we offer. If you'd like to learn more about the survey, uh, the findings, uh, the full findings are posted uh, on the SOA's website under our About uh, the SOA tab. Now I'll turn it back over to Tanya to talk about actuaries in the news. All right. Thanks, Greg. I'm sorry. Thanks, Greg. Um, talking about actuaries in the news, um, we have heard very clearly from the member and candidate survey, and I've also heard from just informal discussions with members and some emails that I've received that our members think is very important that the SOA continue to make our profession more visible to both employers and the general and public. And the SOA is very involved and has done a lot in this area, and I'm going to give you just a little sense of what we're doing. Um, but it is important to point out that it's not just about getting the word actuary out there in the um, media and trending on Twitter, so to speak. What we're trying to do is make sure that our members, our actuaries, are helping inform the public about some pretty important issues, and those include enterprise risk management, health care, retirement, and other important topics. So we're looking to have our members go to these different publications and tell them what actuaries think about different topics, and these are often individual perspectives, but they all come from an actuarial background. Um, you can see on the slide there, there's just a few of the publications that we're highlighting that have had recent coverage by our members, but there are many, many more. I get multiple emails um, throughout the month about different placements that we've had where actuaries have provided some input to some news stories and different publications. Um, in global finance, we had um, some coverage of our emerging risk survey, and the New York Times included some SOA data on Americans working longer, and then the Post wrote an article talking about our work regarding health care costs and how they are, the costs are rising more slowly. So we've gotten some good coverage, and we continue to work on that to make sure people understand what actuaries have to say in all these important topics, and we'll continue to make sure that the SOA is focused on that. Um, in a slightly different angle than going out to the different publications, we also, we the SOA, also now have a YouTube channel. Um, so I, I will tell you we don't have any cute cat videos yet, but we do have some interviews out there that you can look at um, and also some other important pieces. So it's got some really good information out there. Um, for example, we had a couple of members, Ian Duncan and Susan Pantelli, um, who has been promoting actual insights on the Affordable Care Act, which has certainly been all over the media lately, especially after the um, recent Supreme Court ruling. They um, were interviewed at the health meeting, and you can look at their interview. It's posted out there on our YouTube channel. Um, just look for youtube.com slash society of actuaries. Um, and also, we're always looking for people who are willing to speak to the media on behalf of the profession. So if you're interested and you've got a story to tell, then contact us at memberscoms, that's M-E-M-B-E-R-C-O-M-M-S, at SOA.org. Um, and we will be happy to talk to you about your story and see what we can do with it. Um, I know I've enjoyed any opportunities I've had to kind of get involved in some media um, coverage. It's just really fun to um, let people know what our profession is about and what we have to say about these important issues. Um, we don't want to be the best kept secret as a profession, and we also want to make sure that people are well informed on all of these important items. So thanks to those volunteers who have been involved, and if you would like to be involved, let us know. Now, looking, um, another thing that we are um, looking at is our Centers of Actual Excellence Summits. And these are a couple of events that we have coming up. Um, not everyone may be familiar with our Center of Actual Excellence. This is something we started about three years ago. 
um, the CAE program, or the Center of Actual Excellence program, was set up to help identify the actual science programs that embody what we see as a dynamic interaction of instruction, research, and scholarship. Um, these universities provide our profession with important research and scholarship, and we want to help them further develop and nurture this work. So the um, SOA Board of Directors established this um, Center of Actual Excellence and is part of our commitment to doing just that. The SOA works with these schools, and we are looking to really um, strengthen the actual science, and we also do this through um, targeted grants and education and research, and we're also starting to have some meetings with these. Um, centers of Actual Excellence each year is a conference and a student summit, which um, you'll see on the next page, where we're going to talk um, to the faculty and students to get their input on what the SOA is doing. Uh, first, I'll talk about the faculty conference. And at this conference, um, we have all 23 of our CAE schools are going to be participating in this conference that's going to be held later this month on the 19th through the 20th. And here we're going to bring in the faculty, and they're going to share and um, we're going to show their input, and we're going to get feedback from them on our SOA initiatives. And those who attend will also participate in some breakout sessions on different topics. So we're going to get a lot of input and understanding on their perspective of what our profession is doing and what we're doing as an organization. And those who have been granted a CAE award are going to give some presentations on their projects. This year, we're going to have a presentation from Georgia State and also the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, for the second part, um, that, this is going to be for the first time we're going to have a student summit, and I'm excited about this because I'm actually going to get to attend this, and that's going to be in August, mid-August, August 16th through 17th here in Chicago. We're going to have um, two student leaders from each of our 23 schools. They've been invited and are going to participate, and it's going to cover a lot of different student-focused topics. We're going to have an interactive panel uh, with some SO leaders and local actuaries, so Brad and I are going to be on that panel along with... Um, Jim Monge, uh, Liz Job, and Karen DeToro. Um, so we have some folks who will be taking some questions and um, having some dialogue with these student leaders from our different CAE schools. We're also going to have some breakout sessions, and we're going to be looking um, throughout all of this to get some student feedback on our SOA strategic directions and marketing efforts. I think it's really important that we don't just go to our very seasoned members who obviously have a lot of good insight and input for our strategic direction to help us understand where we need to go as an organization, but also to look at those who are fairly new and starting down this path or still taking exams. Um, they, they just have a different perspective, and they, they have a much more broader view of what the profession could be and could offer. So I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm very excited about hearing what the students have to say at the summit in August. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to Brad, and he's going to give us some updates and reminders. Thanks, Tanya. I'm really looking forward to that uh, the, the student uh, session. It should be very interesting. Um, let me give you a quick update on the development of the general insurance track. Since announcing the, the SOA's intention to offer a general insurance casualty insurance education track beginning in the fall of 2013, I had the opportunity to meet with many members at actuarial club meetings and at the spring health and life and annuity uh, meetings. Offering a general insurance, casualty insurance education track is not only consistent with SOA's strategic objectives, it's necessary if the SOA is to attain its objectives. Doing so clearly benefits our candidates as it gives them more flexibility for a longer period of time in determining their chosen course of specialization. Benefits those practicing outside North America where the lines between specialties are not as bright as they are here. But what value does this bring to the existing membership? Personally, I can say without equivocation that my membership in the SOA has been and continues to be my most valuable economic and professional asset. Maintaining and enhancing the value of that asset has to be at the top of the list of the leadership of the SOA. If it is not, we're not doing our job. I can tell you that the staff of the SOA, its volunteers, and its leadership work every day with this primary objective in mind. Globalization brings both opportunities and threats to our employers, our professional organizations, and to each of us as actuarial professionals. Adding the general insurance, casualty insurance track gives all members mid-career flexibility with respect to the specialty they wish to practice. Being a member of an actuarial organization that is widely recognized as the most respected such organization in the world will mitigate some of those risks and accentuate many of the opportunities. 
offering a general insurance casualty insurance track will help ensure the SOA's status for the, for the foreseeable future. Enhancing and maintaining the value of your SOA credential is at the forefront of all decisions made by your board, and it, it, and it was when deciding to offer the general insurance casualty insurance track. Now I'll turn it over to Greg, and, and he'll give an update on, on the recent uh, CIA annual meeting. And, and uh, Greg? Thanks, Brad. Uh, uh, I did attend uh, this year's uh, uh, CIA annual meeting, as I did uh, last year, uh, on behalf of the SOA. Uh, Canadians are about 18% of SOA members and about the same percentage of our candidates. And our relationship and service to this community is critically important to the organization. Uh, for the past year, we've had a major strategic initiative underway to engage more fully with our Canadian members. Uh, so we were one of the sponsors of the CIA's annual meeting uh, in June. Uh, about 500 people attended, and it was a terrific meeting. Uh, Mike Boot, one of our senior staffers, Joe DiDominici, our, our uh, new uh, Canadian staff fellow, Bob Wolf, and I made several uh, session presentations at the meeting. Uh, the SOA also sponsored the networking reception, where our board, uh, one of our board vice presidents, Martin Soyer, spoke on the progress we're making in the Canadian uh, Member Engagement Initiative. Our Canadian members are also receiving uh, our new uh, quarterly newsletter, The Canadian Corner, from Joe Dominici. First one in April, uh, second edition coming soon. Joe's also developing more Canadian-focused uh, CPD, uh, and we have two Canadian healthcare research projects underway right now. Joe's also arranged for uh, several of us to make uh, employer visits uh, with major Canadian actuarial employers to make sure we understand their views and perspectives. Finally, I would just uh, add by saying we've, uh, we're working to have a continuing dialogue on a variety of uh, critical strategic issues with the CIA leadership, both at uh, their annual meeting as well as uh, in meetings and discussions we've scheduled uh, in between meetings. We've had excellent relationships with uh, past President Jim Christie, and we look forward to continuing that uh, work with Simon Curtis, Jacques LaFrance, and Michelle Simard. Uh, back to you, uh, Brett. Sorry, Tanya. That's okay. All right, um, here's uh, another update for you. We have the SOA 2012 elections coming up. The candidates for president-elect, vice president, and elected board members have all been announced. And um, this year's candidates for president-elect are Bill Falk and Mark Friedman. I think folks are going to have a tough decision there of those two really great candidates. Um, you can learn more about all of the candidates, not just the president-elect, but also the board positions and the um, different um, sections at the soa.org slash elections website. Um, voting is going to begin August 6th. It's going to close August 31st. It will be just less than a month. Now, if you want to learn more about the um, candidates for president-elect in particular, you can register for the next interactive leader session, which is going to be held on July 25th. I will be moderating this webcast and being very happy to be on the other side of the desk this year. Um, and in this session, we're going to um, ask the president-elect to give us a little bit of information um, about themselves and talk about their background. We're going to have a prepared question that we're going to have them give a response to, but then we're going to have at least 30 minutes where they are going to just be answering your questions. So I hope you will take the time to attend that interactive session and learn more about the candidates and give them some questions and see what they think about the different topics that you want to throw out at them. Um, it's going to be a great opportunity to learn more about the candidates, so um, hope you join us. Also, we have some upcoming events um, that are um, focused on professional development. I talked earlier about the Supreme Court ruling on ACA, or the Affordable Care Act, and um, that is something that a lot of folks are interested in, not just health actuaries such as me. I know that it's, it's just something that everyone needs to really just generally understand. Well, um, on July 17th, we're going to have a webcast, and it's going to talk about what will it mean to you. And it's going to go into a lot of different angles. You're going to get a legal perspective on this, of course, an actuarial perspective. It's going to talk about um, how this decision is going to affect next steps with regards to Medicaid, on um, the exchanges, and the and just the general implementation by employers of all the ACA um, requirements. So be sure to tune in to that on July 17th from noon to 1230 Eastern Time. Also, the SOA is hosting a Business Savvy Skills Seminar, and that's going to be August 1st in Chicago. And I think this is a wonderful thing. Um, 
this is for, um, we keep hearing, and um, Greg mentioned this when he was going over the member candidate survey, that employers want professionals who have a strong business skills in addition to the technical skills, and as actuaries, we are very, very good at covering those technical skills, but we really need to round that out with some general um, business acumen, and this um, business savvy school seminar will be a very good way to kind of promote that. It's for people at all different stages of the career, so don't worry if you just became an actuary or you've been an actuary for many years. It's going to really focus on communication skills. That's going to be the primary focus. And it's going to look at things like persuasive communication, negotiation, listening skills, and leadership communication skills. All of these are just critical. Even if you decide that you're going to focus and just um, stick with a very technical role, um, that's what you enjoy doing, you can't ignore all these other skills because as good as you are technically, at some point you have to take those results and have someone else understand them and use them. So communication skills is just so important. So I hope a lot of people will come out for that. That's August 1st. On August 27th through 29th, out in Hong Kong, we're going to have the International Financial Reporting for Insurers, and um, that's going to be designed for international actuaries who are responsible for the financial reporting and compliance with the IFRS, or International Financial Reporting Standards. Um, finally, we have the Evaluation Actuary Symposium, or lovingly called Bow Act Symposium, and that's going to be out on September 10th through 11th in L.A., and that's going to look at valuation topics in depth with strong content for the experienced financial actuary. So that's a very targeted symposium. Um, you can register for any of these events at SOA.org. Just click on the recently implemented and redesigned event calendar. And um, hope you um, find some of these of interest and choose to plug into some of them. With that, I will hand it over to Pat, who's going to kick off some Q&A. Thanks, Tanya. We would now like to open up the discussion to your questions. Um, as a reminder, you can submit a question by clicking on the Ask a Question box area, typing in the question, and hitting Go. Um, and we have had a few questions come in, so we'll, um, we'll start the Q&A period. Um, in regards to the um, upcoming election, um, there were some questions that came in that really get at um, probably some of the process for um, determining who is on the ballot. Um, sp specifically, the question that came in is um, about why there are two candidates for president-elect this year. Um, in other years, there have been uh, three. Um, Brad, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. The process to determine candidates for election of the to the society board and the SOA vice presidents and president-elect has evolved over time. Issues whether it's preferable to have an open process where individuals nominated by members appear directly on the ballot, or whether there is a vetting process of potential candidates, including those nominated by members by members by a nominating committee. First, a bit of background. The SOA bylaws provide for a nominating committee to have the responsibility of evaluating all nominees and selecting as candidates for election those best qualified to serve as officers and directors of the Society of Actuaries. The nominating committee's work is done independently. No member of the current board has any involvement in the nominating committee's discussions and deliberations. The board does review and approve the ballot as a final step before it is publicized. I do know that the nominating committee carefully considers the needs of the SOA today and into the future in determining the candidates who have the leadership qualities, the vision, and experience to effectively serve on the board, and that the qualities needed that uh, needed uh, by a presidential officer are different than those needed for elected board member or vice president. Personally, I used to believe that an open approach was preferable. However, having served on a number of boards, both commercially and professionally, my thinking has evolved. I experienced the benefits an effective board member can bring. Leadership, a spirit of cooperation, respect for confidentiality, and respect for others' opinions. Consequently, I have changed my mind with, res with respect to this issue. The screening assure that all potentially poor candidates will be eliminated? Of course not but we can eliminate those that we believe will be unable to meet the demands of increased leadership roles. The downside of screen vetting process is the potential appearance of a closed group, all having similar views on key issues facing the society of actuaries, its membership, and their stakeholders. 
a group unwilling to consider disparate views. I can tell you that this has not been my experience. Elected board members vetted by the nominating committee have tended to be very independent, vocal in their views, and supportive when a particular issue does not go their way. This is good. It's evidence that the selection system is working. Last year, Don Siegel, as president of the Society of Actuaries, formed a task force to look at issues surrounding the nomination of candidates for board positions. All smart individuals, people of goodwill with no particular ax to grind. This task force recommended to the board that the current system of vetting candidates through a nominating committee be continued. The board accepted their nomination or their recommendations. I do not see the, the need to redo their work. This year, as Tanya said earlier, the nominating committee identified two candidates willing and qualified to run for president-elect. This is consistent with the guidelines of the nominating committee with, which um, set, that says up to three candidates should be uh, put placed on the ballot. I encourage all of you to attend the uh, July 25th uh, webcast with Tanya uh, with the two um, president-elect candidates, Bill Falk and Ma Mark Friedman. I'm sure it will be very insightful. Tanya, I know that you have some thoughts on this issue. Yes, Brad, I appreciate your comments, and I think you hit on a lot of the important points. I mean, I certainly do appreciate uh, members who have some questions and concerns about our nominating process. And um, it, I, like you, Brad, had one time thought, well, maybe an open election would be more appropriate. But as you get involved in this board and other boards, you understand that you can only have effective governance if you have an effective board. And it's very important that you're very, um, you keep your eyes focused on what each member of that board needs to, what qualities they need to hold to be able to be effective. And I think that the governance, I mean, I'm sorry, the nominating committee is doing a good job um, of going through a very careful process. I know that they are very careful. They put a lot of thought and effort. They are very cautious about how they proceed and what they recommend, and I have a lot of confidence in that nominating committee. And, and with the board as well, um, Brad mentioned that there is concern that you don't get enough disparate views if you have too much control over who's going to be on your ballot and therefore on your board. And it has not been my experience. I've been on the board for many years, and it has not been my experience at all that we have not had disparate views represented. I can assure you that my view has not always been the common view on the board, and um, I, it's, we've had some very robust discussions and interesting challenges to things that I thought were pretty clear. So we've had a pretty good um, representation of different views. Um, I, I'm comfortable with the nominating committee. I think that a review of the nominating committee that Don Siegel had um, set up was, was well done, and I feel comfortable with the information that they gave us and how we're moving forward. So with that, I think that should answer that question. Thanks, Tanya. Um, uh, somewhat of a follow-up question to that um, came in regarding um, uh, how various presidents will, will often come in, presidents of the SOA will come in um, with interesting new initiatives that they want to um, begin and, and see through, um, but they're, they're, of course, limited to one year term as president. Um, has there been any thought to extending the term to two years so that presidents have more time to see their initiatives through? Well, I'll take, take a shot at that, Pat. The, uh, um uh, I don't know of any discussion at all with respect to that uh, having taken place, and 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 quite frankly, I, I think uh, it would be increasingly difficult to get people to commit to a two-year term as, as as president. So uh, um, personally, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't uh, be in favor of that, and and actually, I don't think that it's needed. The reality is, um, and now I'm nearing the end of my uh, presidential term. And the the real the difference between the presidential officers, which form the the leadership team, along with the secretary, treasurer, and the executive director, um, and the president is 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 uh, de minimis. Actually, the 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 the, real, the only real difference is is essentially the bully pulpit that the president is afforded, and. Uh, the reality is the strategic plan directs the day-to-day -day and the tactics that evolve from the strategic plan uh, direct the day-to-day -day activities uh, uh, of, of the staff and of the Society of Actuaries. 
the the fact that presidential officers serve for four years, I think, allows for a great deal of the continuity that the, uh, a two-year term for president uh, uh, for the uh, actual office of president would afford. So. Um, uh, although I'm rolling off as a, a uh, as president of the society in a few months, uh, I still anticipate uh, being active as uh, Don Siegel and, and Mike McLaughlin have been as uh, media past president and penultimate past president this year. The strategic initiatives, like I said, are guided by the plan, and 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 the, the other constant is the staff, which is really uh, a consistent. Uh, uh, you know, compass for for the direction of the Society of Actuaries, and and represents kind of uh, uh, the the historical memory uh, 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 of the organization. I don't know, Tanya. Do you want to add anything on on a two year term? You ready to take take a two year obligation? Well, thanks for that offer, Brad. <laughs> I have actually heard a few folks toss this idea around about having a two years instead of a one year, um, but I think that. Part of that suggestion is coming from maybe not a full understanding, as you have outlined, of what the responsibilities are for not just the president and the, the two years after that, but also the president-elect. Um, and we do have pretty much an equal footing as far as how we um, operate on that leadership team and really on the board, um, other than, as you pointed out, your opportunities to kind of speak to folks as the president of the organization. Um, so having two years, I don't think that would really accomplish anything um, in addition to how we have it set up now with the additional years on the leadership team. Um, we do have an issue advisory um, council that processes any suggestions for strategic initiatives. They evaluate them and they determine if and how these um, ideas for strategic initiatives are presented to the board. So even if a president comes in, for example, if I come in with a the latest, greatest idea that I think um, the SOA should be focused on when I um, become president later this fall, I would still need to go through the proper process of having that issues advisory council evaluated and determine if it is something that should be moved forward to the board and then officially established as an initiative. All of our initiatives went through that process, and that's how we work as an organization. So we don't get um, sidetracked from left to right on different diversions, and we keep focused on the um, strategy that we set as an organization. Great, thanks. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we had a question come in um, on the fee structure for um, general and section-sponsored webcasts. Um, the point that this person has made is that the, the speakers are usually volunteers and wondering um, how fees are determined based on that fact. Greg, this seems like an operational issue that, that you might have some thoughts on. Sure, Pat. I'm happy to take this one. There are uh, there are costs of uh, hosting the web conference calls, of course, uh, not only uh, for the communication services, but also the staff support that's necessary to organize those and promote them and 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 so forth. Uh, and the SOA and 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 our sections uh, do receive a return from the webcast. These returns help fund uh, other activities, both the SOA generally and the sections uh, specifically. Uh, the SOA offers uh, nearly 50 webcasts every year, and we try to cover a wide range of topics of interest uh, to our members. Uh, some of those webcasts have very high registration, others don't, so some uh, will certainly produce uh, returns in excess of their costs, and others uh, will not. Um, just as, as the questioner noted, uh, just as at our in-person meetings, the speakers are volunteered and are not paid, which is an important way that they contribute to the ongoing uh, development and advancement of the profession. Uh, with respect to the question of how we determine the fees, uh, our professional development committee uh, recommends the fee level for continuing education programs. Uh, they carefully monitor the fee level to make sure that what the SOA charges for its programs is uh, uh, relevant, uh, close to, comparable to, competitive with uh, those charged by other actuarial organizations and other sources of uh, CPD that our members may take, uh, take account of. So. Uh, we are pricing these on a competitive basis to make sure that uh, we're both uh, reasonable and appropriate, covering our costs and helping support uh, other activities uh, while still being reasonable for our members. Uh, final uh, reminder, uh, section members uh, can use a $25 discount uh, coupon this year that we've offered uh, to further uh, reduce the fee level that they're paying for these, uh, for these events. Great, thanks. 
Um, Tanya, when um, when you were speaking about the candidate uh, relationship initiative, that new initiative, um, you, you talked about one of the um, factors behind that is that there are um, you know various professions that are competing for the the same tor same sort of um, students as um, as our profession is. What the question that came in was, what are some of those other industries and careers um, in which we're competing for those those bright, um, usually math-focused candidates? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, from our visits to universities, we're seeing students who um, have additional interest in uh, lots of different areas, including engineering, um, accounting, economics, um, business analytics. We're starting to see that, as well as investment banking and medicine, and that's just a few of them. So they have a lot of pretty varied interests, Pat. I think um, some of the um, accounting, economics, business analytics, investment banking, those are probably the more growing areas, but we see a lot of interest in different areas, and, and they're all looking to grow their profession just as we are with some of the, really, the, the best candidates, so it's important that we keep that in mind as we move forward with our, um, member, our, candidate, member, our candidate relationship initiative. And Brad, I know you and I were talking earlier this morning about this initiative, um, and I know you had some thoughts on, on the importance of it. Um, anything you wanted to add in, to what Tanya has said about this initiative? Uh, well, no, I thought that Tanya um, outlined it very well. The, uh, the reality is uh, I mean, we want to get to know these people earlier uh, rather than later. We want to communicate um, uh, exactly what it means to be a professional uh, and to be an actuarial professional specifically. We want to make sure they understand what will be demanded of them um, if they choose to be an actuary. And uh, we want to help them to make the right career choice so that if, in fact, um, being an actuary is, is not the right career choice, uh, they find out earlier rather than later. And, and in fact, uh, more importantly, if, in fact, they're even considering it, it's just remotely considering it, uh, and they just kind of randomly take an uh, actuarial exam because they heard of them, uh, we want to uh, enhance that relationship so that we uh, uh, increase the, the, the chances that they uh, will view actuarial, uh, uh, the actuarial profession as one that they want to pursue. All right, if I can just add to that. Also, um, we talk a lot about looking for different ways for actuaries to practice in different areas in the financial um, sector, et cetera. I, I really think that a lot of the ideas and um, different ways that we're going to discover are going to come from our younger members, and so getting more input from our candidates and understanding what they're seeing and learning as they go through their studies and evaluation of the different careers will be very helpful in helping us um, determine what we want to do in areas that we can explore further and um, penetrate more with actual science. Great, thanks. Um, Brad, we've had some um, people ask for an update on the consolidation idea that, that you raised um, several months ago. Yes, uh, well, the, um, it, it, we, at this point we're waiting for uh, uh, a consolidation task force, which is an industry-wide uh, task force consisting of two members of each of the five U.S.-based actuarial organizations uh, uh, whose charge was to develop um, an outline for the uh, for an optimum structure of the actuarial profession uh, in the United States. Uh, th their uh, charge was to uh, de uh, de uh, you know create the uh, and, and deliver that report uh, by August 15th. That will give us some insight. Um, uh, since uh, my address at the annual meeting last year and la last October. Um, we have heard from a number of the organizations. Uh, um, ASPA um, is, is uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, sitting there, uh, sitting on the side, just observing, as uh, as is the, the CCA at this point. Um, our first uh, contact was with uh, with the CAS, the Casualty Actuarial Society, and they've. Um, now unequivocally said that they're not interested in, in consolidation. They made it very clear, and we respect that. And that, that um, as I've talked about earlier, led, has led us to uh, uh, begin the development of the general insurance track as, as uh, a, a necessary uh, um, uh, step in, in meeting our strategic objectives. Um, so uh, um, that that clearly is is not going to happen. I think the uh, academy's view is that um, uh, before the academy would consider uh, a consolidation, they they um, 
I think the the SOA and CAS should uh, uh, determine whether they were going to consolidate. Uh, so uh, um, at this point, it's it's you know the the SOA uh, is uh, pursuing its strategic objectives and uh, uh, including the development of of general insurance and in other areas that will. Uh, improve the and, and enhance the the value of the the credential as I talked about uh, earlier and uh, uh, we'll wait and see what the uh, what the task force uh, the uh, the profession wide task force uh, comes up with in uh, review direction at that point great thanks you mentioned the uh, the new general insurance track so let's talk a little bit more about that um, how is that going um, when is it that that you know um, some some more information will be coming um, out on that. Um, are there discussions already underway with the academy in terms of the qualification standards, et cetera? Um, Tanya, do you have um, some thoughts on on that and update? Yeah, I, I know that the curriculum committee is um, hard at work designing the syllabus and they're identifying readings. Um, so we're expecting that final curriculum to be released by May of 2013. And we are also currently in conversations with the Academy regarding the approval process. So things are moving along. We're still on target for May 2013. We're talking to the Academy. Um, so things look on track with the GI track. Yeah, I would just add that uh, we've been in in incredibly encouraged by the uh, reaction of uh, professionals around the world wanting to join and help us uh, on a volunteer basis uh, develop that track. They they all see the, the the tremendous potential of the Society of Actuaries doing so and want to be in, in, on the ground floor of uh, uh, the development. And, um, uh, you know, there's just absolutely no doubt that uh, we will develop a, a world-class uh, uh, educational system consistent with uh, uh, everything else that the, the Society of Actuary do, Actuaries do from uh, uh, or does from an a educational standpoint. So, um, I'm looking forward to uh, continued progress and uh, have the full expectation that we'll be offering exams in the fall of 2013. Great, Brad, you mentioned um, this interest internationally in, in the GI track, um, and you, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the webcast that we've got representatives from um, 11 countries uh, that had registered for this session. Um, what does that tell you, um, kind of all taken together, at your perspective on what the opportunities are internationally? I think the opportunities are, are tremendous. I mean, one way of, of growing is to export your your product to new territories, and 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 that's clearly one method of, for the the actuarial profession and the society of actuaries to grow. Um, I think one of the uh, underappreciated aspects of globalization is. The, the massive migration of rural poor to middle class that's taking place in the uh, in, in the developing countries. I mean, the developing countries. If you go to the urban areas, the, the urban areas of quote developing countries are you know, nearly as developed as we are. It's it's this concept of rural poor uh, becoming middle class that 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 in, in fact makes them growing developing countries. Um, and that, that you know. Uh, People that enter the newly enter the middle class, they start buying things. What they do is they buy cars, they buy uh, places to live, they buy furniture, and 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 consequently they need insurance. Uh, uh, and the first part of the uh, first type of insurance that they need are, is general insurance or casualty insurance. Um, you know, insurance that that insures their car, insures their homes, insures their 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 things, insures them from liability, and that that represents a tremendous growth path for. The actuarial profession and, and and the and the society of actuaries. When I looked at uh, at, at at or Greg showed me the uh, top ten exam centers for the society of actuaries, I was just shocked. And I, I've shown this to a number of members and 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 received uh, uh, equal re a similar reaction from everybody. I mean, the the, the the three of the top ten are aren't surprising at all. It's New York, Chicago, and Hartford. It's what you would expect. And there's uh, two Canadian, uh, uh, Toronto and Montreal, but the but the next five were were just shocking to me, and, and not in, in in order of uh, uh, in any particular order, but uh, uh, Hong Kong, Taipei, Beijing, Seoul, and Kuala Lumpur are five of the top ten um, uh, the 
10 largest uh, exam centers of the Society of Actuaries. I think that that shows you where our growth is. And, and uh, you know, uh, we've got other areas, uh, Latin America, South America. Uh, uh, I think eventually uh, Africa will, will, will develop. We've seen a lot of development uh, 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 coming, taking place uh, and need, similar need, in, in, in the Middle East. So, um, you know, eventually all forms of insurance uh, and, and, and retirement savings and new areas in which actuaries practice uh, uh, including uh, enterprise risk management, will uh, increase the need for actuaries in those countries. So um, I think that uh, expanding internationally is just one uh, tactic, if you will, to, to grow the actuarial profession and, 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 and grow the Society of Actuaries. The Society of Actuaries has approximately 23,000 members worldwide, of those 23,000 members, approximately 3,000 members are outside uh, the U.S. and Canada, outside North America. Um, we are positioned, we have the infrastructure to export that actual expertise, the educational system. Um, you know, people have asked me specifically, why not just leave this to the CAS, the CAS is positioned, or, or the institute and faculty. The CAS has approximately 6,000 members uh, worldwide, of which between two to 300 members um, are outside um, the U.S., Canada, and Bermuda. So they haven't developed the infrastructure that would allow them to aggressively export education internationally. Um, if we, if the Society of Actuaries would not had not stepped in to do so, we would have essentially left that void to the institute and faculty uh, to do so. So, um, I, and 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 quite frankly, talking to the leaders of the institute and faculty, they weren't prepared to to develop that capability for the entire uh, marketplace globally. So, so if the actuarial profession was going to grow where it needed to grow, the Society of Actuaries absolutely needed to step in. And, 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 and offer a general insurance, casualty insurance track. Uh, just uh, one, this, Greg, just uh, one point I wanted to add uh, to what you said, Brad, uh, just another way of looking at that membership. Uh, it's, it's not just a matter of choosing to, because of opportunities, which I agree are very great, uh, to focus on international activities. When you look at where our candidates are coming from today, your top ten exam centers uh, point uh, uh, makes that point really clearly, but among our membership today, about seventy percent of them have a U.S. address. Only about fifty-three percent of our candidates have a U.S. address, and about twenty-eight percent of them are outside of the U.S. So it's not just uh, you know even if we stopped marketing totally uh, outside of the U.S. and Canada today, we would still have a pipeline of, of members coming from those areas. So it's just vital that uh, to serve those members, we have to be in those areas and have to provide services to them. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we've come to the end of our time for today. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in today's session. Um, your questions um, and participation are very much appreciated. And of course, thanks to Brad and Tanya and Greg um, for your leadership. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a short survey right at the end of this webinar, and hope you will take just a moment to fill that out. Um, we always look forward to the results and, and make changes um, based on those. So with that, thank you so much. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.